yeah so uh, welcome everyone uh, to the last talk in this program so uh, the talk is by professor abhijit champanerka and he will continue his talk over to you abhijit thank you very much and let me just share my screen all right uh, this is the second talk on hyperbolic knot theory and as uh, we saw uh, yesterday we stopped at hyperbolic uh, three manifold just a little definition of hyperbolic three manifolds um, so today we will look at a little bit more structure theorems for hyperbolic three manifolds uh, ideal triangulations gluing equations some examples uh, snappy and if i get time i would want to do one more thing which i'm not going to say now so it will be like a surprise. <laughs> so uh, I'll go a little faster than uh, last time, than yesterday. I should also mention there's a further reading link which I've posted. Uh, there, is a, there are a lot of resources which I've put up on this website and you can go and take a look. So we so, saw, yes. Yeah, will it be okay if you can uh, give that link on the ICTS website under the resources section? Yeah, absolutely. It, it probably is already there. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Um, so we saw a hyperbolic three manifold. We will always mean a, a finite volume complete orientable hyperbolic three manifold uh, for this part, most part of the talk. Um, it can be seen as uh, the quotient of H3 by a discrete and torsion free group of isometries PSL to C is the orientation preserving isometries of H3. Uh, a, a, a gamma like that is called a Kleinian group, but in general Kleinian group uh, uh, can have torsion or it can also be, uh, need not be, the quotient need not be finite volume, but we are going to want it to be finite volume. And equivalently, there is a covering map, the universal cover of M can be seen as uh, the hyperbolic three space where the covering translations uh, are, are uh, isometries of H3. And that's equivalent to saying that there is a representation of the fundamental group uh, into the group of isometries of H3, which is discrete and faithful. So these are the three ways usually you see it and we move between different points of view, depending on what aspect we want to emphasize. So before we start going to hyperbolic knots, I just want to um, say, a, uh, say a couple of things about uh, the structure theory of hyperbolic three manifolds. So uh, the, that's the first thing about today. Uh, it's called the structure of hyperbolic three manifolds. So what do we mean by structure? So there is a uh, 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 and as I said, I want to go a little faster today. So I'm going to just uh, uh, put in a bunch of images and then I will read uh, some parts of it. And I would also write some things. So the first thing uh, we want to see is the structure is Mostov Prasad rigidity theorem. What this says, it's a very important theorem. It says that if you have a hyperbolic three manifolds, Again, everything is finite volume, complete and orientable, et cetera. Uh, and if there is a homotopy equivalence between them, then this is homotopic to an isometry. And which means that homotopy equivalence implies isometry. Now, because uh, you, are, you have hyperbolic three manifolds, their cover is H3, which is, um, which is contractible. And that implies that uh, if they have isomorphic fundamental groups, uh, then they are isometric. And that immediately says that the hyperbolic structure on three manifolds is unique. And um, this has a fantastic corollary. It means that all geometric invariants you are computing are actually topological invariants. Now we have to note that this is not true. So this is certainly not true uh, in dimensions two. Uh, I should add, it's actually, this is true for all dimensions greater than three. 
it's not just be three manifolds. Uh, it's actually true for uh, dimensions n greater than equal to three. And this is not true in dimension two. Of course, you have the whole Teichmuller space worth of structures. Uh, plus, also not true for uh, and other geometries. For example, if you take Euclidean geometry and if you take the torus, for example, you can get a torus of any area. You can basically scale it and make it bigger. You cannot do this for a hyperbolic uh, a three manifold. So that is, uh, that is the first uh, structural theorem. This, is a, this has a great consequence. It means that all geometric invariants to compute, for example, volume or uh, systole length or uh, uh, any kind of, uh, uh, say, uh, the, the canonical cell decomposition, etc. All of these are topological invariants. So that immediately gives us a lot of invariants to work with. The second thing, uh, which uh, uh, is telling a little bit about the structure of hyperbolic three manifolds, and uh, that is what is called the Margulis thick and thin decomposition. So what the thick and thin decomposition it tells you that the what are called the thin parts are basically cusps and they look like a torus cross zero infinity and there's a metric on there. What it means is that as you keep on going towards infinity, these tori actually uh, become smaller and smaller at an exponential rate. And what are these tori? These tori are actually uh, just uh, uh, sections of, uh, they, are, they are quotients of the, um, uh, of horospheres by just a group of translations. So uh, the, a cusp will look something like this. So that is what a cusp looks like. And um, uh, if you look, if you want to draw in H3, uh, what's going on is If you draw in H3, you have this horosphere we saw yesterday, and this is just the quotient of everything about this. That's what you're, you're getting. So you're basically quotienting all of this, and this goes on to a curve like this. Uh, and that gives a very nice consequence. It means that if you take a non compact hyperbolic three manifold, and let me remind you, it's all finite volume and orientable then it's, it's topologically, it is basically, it's topologically an interior of a compact three manifold with torus boundaries. Now that works very well for us because if you look at knot and link complements, then they are three manifolds with torus boundary. And so their interiors has some uh, chance of being hyperbolic. And uh, that's exactly what the, what the next uh, part is about, which is about hyperbolic knots. So and so um, a knot is a hyperbolic or a link is hyperbolic uh, if its complement is a hyperbolic three manifold. Uh, what I would want to draw is hyperbolic knots and links. And right away to start with, uh, we have this very nice theorem by Thurston that uh, uh, it's the geometrization of knot complements. Uh, you actually, uh, every knot in S3 is either a torus knot or a satellite knot or a hyperbolic knot. So uh, that that's, gives us lots and lots of hyperbolic knots and links uh, in, uh, in S3. And now what we can do is uh, we can focus on a certain class of knots, say for example, alternating knots and links, and many nice, thing ha nice things happen for a, a hyper alternating knots and links. And so one of the nice things which happens here is that we can characterize alternating, uh, which alternating knots and links are hyperbolic. So uh, this is 
uh, Manasco's theorem. Oh, I wanted to put up a picture of Thurston and Manasco. Let me just do that. I've taken some of the pictures from uh, slides of other people. What happened? This is a nice picture showing with the figure eight knot. And let me also put up a picture of my NASCAR. Okay, so what is Manasco's theorem? Manasco says that most prime alternating knots are hyperbolic. That is, um, if K is a connected prime alternating knot diagram, except the standard 2Q torus knot diagram, then K is hyperbolic. So that gives you a very nice diagrammatic condition uh, for alternating knots. You can basically look at an alternating knot and decide whether it's hyperbolic or not. And you don't have to go through any kind of geometry or topological obstructions uh, to, to go through uh, to prove it is hyperbolic. So let's just kind of uh, look at the hyperbolic knot senses or just senses of uh, knots and we can actually uh, look at the knot table and we can figure out which knots are uh, hyperbolic. So here is the first uh, knots up to nine crossings and now we can just cross out. So of course uh, this is a knot is a torus knot so that's not hyperbolic. Uh, three one is a torus knot that is not a hyperbolic. This knot is the figure eight. This is a wonderful knot. It started everything. Figure eight. Uh, five one is a torus knot. So this is not hyperbolic. Uh, there seven one is a torus knot. So that is not hyperbolic. Then if you keep on going like this, nine one is a torus knot. So that is not hyperbolic. Now that's pretty much it. And you can see most knots here are hyperbolic uh, and they because they are alternating except there are three non-alternating knots on this picture these are the three not al non-alternating knots these are non-alternating and among these also uh, two of them are hyperbolic since 819 is the torus knot the so torus knots cannot be uh, hyperbolic from Thurston's theorem. They're either torus or satellite or hyperbolic. So these are non-alternating, but otherwise everything else here is hyperbolic. So um, that is also a, a very nice uh, a way to just look at an alternating knot diagram and figure out whether it's hyperbolic or not. So any questions so far? Okay, so let me go to the next part, uh, which is going to be uh, ideal triangulations. So this is ideal triangulations. So I'm just going to put up a little bit of notation. Uh, It's not very complicated, just uh, understanding what we are, we are looking at. So you're, we start with a compact oriented three is manifold. It? Yes. Yeah, there is a comment, uh, there is a question from Tejas. Yes. So is it easy to figure out the knot diagram, uh, figure out from the knot diagram if the knot is prime? Uh, for alternating, yes, it is easy. That is the theorem of Manasco and Pistilquate, that the primeness uh, uh, can be seen on the diagram because all Conway spheres are visible. Yeah, that's a good question. Thank you. Yes. So everything is diagrammatic for, for alternating knots. So 
uh, what are we going to do for ideal triangulations? I just need to set up some notation just so that we know what we are looking at here. So M is a compact oriented three manifold with uh, torus boundary, non empty torus boundary. And M, M uh, hat is going to be M with each component of the boundary to be coned to one point. So uh, say something like this. So this is what it's going to look like. So here is your M and now each, uh, uh, each torus boundary component is coned up to a point. So these are the cone points. And of course, then if you take M minus the cone points, that is exactly equal to the interior of the manifold. So I'm making all of these distinctions because uh, we are, we, we want to look at the hyperbolic structure is going to happen on the interior of the manifold M topologically. So that's why I'm just being a little careful about this. And now uh, uh, script T uh, is a delta complex structure on this M hat, right? So that you have M hat is a union of some three simplices and the vertices of T are the cone points of, uh, of M. So what we are effectively doing uh, is we are uh, triangulating this thing something like that, so that all of the vertices here are the cone points. So something you can, you can think of something like this, going on having triangles in here. And uh, now uh, such a, such a um, uh, triangulation T is called an ideal triangulation of M and the vertices of, and the T minus the vertices is again the interior of M. And so I, I keep um, because the hyperbolic structure is going to come up over here. So this is the interior of M, right? And um, the, it's called ideal triangulation again because T minus vertices are what the object is. And when we try to uh, the, add some geometry to this, then we are going to make every uh, tetrahedra here as an ideal tetrahedron. An ideal tetrahedron have their vertices at the sphere of infinity. So they are like, uh, uh, they are uh, topologically or combinatorially uh, three simplices without the vertices. And that is why this ideal thing is coming in. But this right now is a completely combinatorial object. Okay. So, uh, and this, this ideal triangulation is really a triangulation or a delta complex structure on M hat, but we are kind of going to delete the vertices. So uh, this is a very simple ex exercise or proposition that the number of edges uh, of T is equal to the number of tetrahedra in T. So uh, now that we have an ideal triangulation, what do we do with this ideal triangulation? So, uh, so now the idea is that we are going to make uh, each of this uh, three simplex an ideal tetrahedra in H3, what we studied yesterday. So the idea is that idea is uh, a given hyperbolic structure give a hyperbolic structure on M interior, interior of M by making uh, each tetrahedra in T into a hyperbolic, hyperbolic ideal uh, tetrahedra. So what we are going to say is that we are going to assume this let delta i uh, be equal to uh, the hyperbolic tetrahedron with parameter z, right? So remember we saw last time, uh, that is last class, you have this, so that's your zi and then zi prime, etc. 
right? So something like this. And now when we, when we try to glue, so there are going to be obstructions. So now when we glue, then try to glue using isometries, try to glue uh, tetrahedra using isometries. So they have to, the shapes have to work out, right? So what are going to be the uh, three things which are going to come up? There is one thing about faces. Then there is, you have to check that the hyperbolic structure first extends for you start with one tetrahedron and you, you extend it uh, along a face, right? So that is the one thing. Then there is going to be, you have to check for, for extension along edges. And the third thing is uh, we have to check out the ideal vertices. I'm going to put it in uh, quotes because it's ideal, but at ideal vertices, we have to check out that the, the, the things work out. So this is the idea of what we are going to do. And so uh, that's the beginning. And now the gluing equations come up. So how do the gluing equations come up? So first of all, let's look at the faces. What happens with the faces uh, see, all ideal tri uh, triangles are isometric. So all ideal triangles, ideal triangles in H2 are isometric. And so that implies that all of these faces are isometric. That implies you can always glue along faces, so there is no obstruction. So gluing along faces is okay. Along faces uh, is okay. The hyperbolic structure extends. The second thing is edges. Now when we are looking, now when we are gluing along edges, We have to make sure that as the tetrahedra go around the edges, they actually close up in the correct way. What do I mean? What I'm just going to show you a picture. This is what I mean. So when you go, go uh, around the edges, there is an edge here. And when I, when I start gluing tetrahedra, look at all the tetrahedra which are incident to this edge. And when we start gluing around them, they have to kind of close up properly. So uh, tetrahedra have to close up properly. Tetrahedra have to close up. Close up around edges. And what does that mean? It means that if you look at this if you look at this green part I'm looking at from a vertex here and these green triangles, right? These green triangles have to close up. So if this tetrahedra are going to be clo closing up here, and if I just take a slice of this along some kind of a, 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 a horosphere, which is a Euclidean plane, since all of them are gluing back properly, these things have to glue up like this, right? So you start over here, they have to glue up but there is more is not only do they have to glue up properly, they have to go around it only once. You cannot go around it many times like this. So, uh, so your angle sum has to be equal to pi only. Angle sum has to be equal to two pi, not pi. Angle sum has to be equal to two pi. And what happens when we are going around like this? When we are going around like this, Now these are, these are tetrahedra, ideal hyperbolic tetrahedra. So they have these parameters. And so as you're going around gluing it, you can start off the first tetrahedra um, at zero one ZI. And as you start gluing these parameters along for this edge, right? So there is an edge over here. You're looking at it from, uh, imagine you're looking down from infinity. So this actually, there is an edge here. And as you start gluing and as they keep on gluing around like this, you will get an equation here. So you get a, uh, an equation uh, 
in the tetrahedral H parameters, in the tetrahedral H parameters. Uh, for every H. Now, how do these tetrahedral parameters look like? These tetrahedral parameters look like either ZI, ZI prime or uh, ZI double prime, right? So uh, let me just show you this. This is the picture we saw last time. This is your H parameter, what it looks like. You have Z, Z prime, Z double prime, and the opposite edges, because of the symmetry of the ideal tetrahedron, get the same number, same H parameter. So this is what it looks like. And you have Z is the parameter, and Z prime is one upon one minus Z, Z double prime is like so. And so you get an equation, and what does this equation look like? This equation looks like this. So this is an edge gluing equation. Uh, there are some uh, coefficients a i j. I stands for the what tetrahedra you are in, and j stands in for the edge. Now remember, there are the same number of edges as the tetrahedra. That was that little exercise which uh, I mentioned. And so um, the edge gluing equations are there is an equation, an algebraic equation in the z i's in the variable z i's, and there is an angle sum. Uh, plus an angle sum of two pi at every edge. So this is the edge gluing equation. It is an algebraic equation in ZIs and plus an angle equation. So that's what happens where, remember what we are trying to look at gluing around edges. So if this equation is satisfied, then that would imply that the hyperbolic structure extends around the edges. So this implies that hyperbolic structure uh, extends uh, across edges. Across edges. And that is good. You will get a hyperbolic structure. The problem is completeness. This structure may not be complete. However, uh, this may not be complete. So what do we have to look for for completeness? Now, what is, the, um, uh, what is the criterion for completeness? That comes from the Margulis lemma, actually. When we look at the structure of the cusp, every tori which is there, and let me just go back up. There's a little subtle point which you may not have noticed back, but let me just point out here. What, if you have a complete hyperbolic three manifold, the structure of the cusp, each of this tori here is actually Euclidean. It's a scaled Euclidean tori. So this tori here is actually a scaled uh, Euclidean structure. Euclidean torus. So you can see from this, it can be seen from this metric because the thick thin decomposition not only gives a topological thing, but actually describe it geometrically. And this metric is basically the Euclidean metric with some scaling factor. So this is a scaled Euclidean tori. So what do we have to do at the vertex is you can think of this as an ideal vertex. So right here is your ideal vertex. So hence there is a completeness criterion coming on for here. This is very similar to what happens for uh, surfaces also. If you look at the geometry, hyperbolic geometry for surfaces, uh, and if you have a cusp point, this is very similar uh, things which are going on. And so we have to understand, uh, look at uh, look at vertices. So that's what, uh, look at vertices. So that's the next part uh, for three uh, vertices. And so at every vertex, now if you look at the vertex, what what are we uh, the what do we see? Um, let me just look go back to this picture. Where am I? Oops, 
I have added a slide in the wrong way. Not one more. So what happens is when we are gluing together this tetrahedra, these triangles are actually gluing together to form, uh, uh, from, form a torus. And these triangles are only understood, uh, are well defined up to scaling. Right of similarity. So we actually get a similarity structure on the torus. So what is happening at the vertices is that um, the, the linked torus, the uh, torus uh, formed by the linked triangles, by the linked triangles of the, the vertices of tetrahedra uh, get a similarity structure. And uh, co for completeness, the similarity structure has to be Euclidean. has to be Euclidean. Now, how do we determine this Euclideanness of the structure? Um, so let me just explain this on using this picture. So, so what does we see in this picture? are these are all linked triangles which are forming the torus so this is your torus and this is the this is the link triangle uh, so what by by link triangle i mean the triangles like this that's all it is okay so these are the triangles <coughs> And this is some generator of the fundamental group. Let's say a meridian. This is a meridian. And as we go along, uh, you take a meridian which is normal, uh, meaning that it doesn't pass through vertices and intersects edges transversely. So you look at uh, this meridian, some meridian curve on the torus, meridian on the torus. Then uh, as you follow along, these tetrahedral parameters are telling you what is the hyperbolic transformation which is being used in order to move from this one triangle to the other. And so as you keep on going, this edge will be identified with this edge and it will give you what is the geometric transformation which is going to do that. Now for it to be complete, it has to be a translation. But in general, it will be some kind of a dilation. And so uh, for this curve here, for this curve, uh, you can associate to it, to it a, uh, uh, a, a holonomy. And how is this holonomy described? This, is, this holonomy is described in terms of these tetrahedral parameters. So this is described um, in these tetrahedral uh, parameters. And what happens is that uh, for it to be a translation and, and uh, for completeness, this requires it to be a translation. So it has to be Euclidean. And how is this you will be Euclidean if this holonomy, holonomy is a translation? Right? That's a Euclidean torus, translations on, in, in two independent directions. And so uh, this condition gives you another equation called the completeness equation. So this completeness equation also looks
like the edge gluing equations, it is in the tetrahedral parameter zi zi prime or zi double prime. And this is going to be at the meridian and it's going to be at every cusp. So for every cusp, we are going to get uh, uh, these many equations. So suppose there are uh, edge cusps. So for every cusp, we'll get two equations. And for every edge, we'll get one equation. So you have a bunch of equations and these are called the Thurston's gluing equations. So these are the, these are called Thurston's. gluing equations. So what is the theorem here? So the theorem is how to find hyperbolic structures. So you have a ideal triangulation, you set up this, um, uh, these gluing equations, let T be an ideal triangulation. Triangulation of M uh, with N tetrahedra, with N tetrahedra and H a boundary tori. So if the point, if a point, uh, I'm going to indicate it uh, with Z naught with these coordinates, uh, with uh, imaginary of ZI, not greater than zero. See, each each of these parameters is in the upper half plane uh, for all i to n satisfies uh, the uh, the gluing equations, the edge and the completeness gluing equations. So edge gluing equations has. Uh, the equation plus the angle sum, edge plus completeness, completeness. Uh, and then M admits a complete hyperbolic structure. So M admits a complete uh, hyperbolic uh, structure. And there's a very nice corollary to this. You can also compute various invariants. For example, we looked at the volume of an ideal tetrahedron uh, yesterday. And so you immediately can compute with this computation a volume, uh, which is just going to be the sum of the, uh, the volumes of the various uh, tetrahedra which are involved. So you immediately uh, get this volume. There is a very nice proposition uh, that you have some special property of the ideal triangulation, then you can, you can immediately get uh, the structure very easily. So what is the special property? Uh, if, if your ideal tetrahedron, uh, uh, sorry, if your ideal triangulation has the property that every edge is six valent, uh, has the property has the property that every edge is six valent, uh, then, then the point uh, e to the power I, pi i by three dot 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 uh, gives complete hyperbolic structure. Gives complete hyperbolic structure.
structure. And what is this point? Uh, this point basically uh, is that uh, this is this is each tra uh, tetrahedra is a regular ideal tetrahedra. So uh, each here, what that means is that each tetrahedron is the regular ideal tetrahedron, which has the maximum volume. And we saw that yesterday. Regular ideal Uh, so just before I go into doing some examples, I just want to say that um, if you look at if you look at uh, a, a hyperbolic knot and you ask the question, well, how many? What is the minimum number of uh, uh, tetrahedra required uh, to uh, in an ideal triangulation of that? That gives you geometric complexity. Uh, on knots, so there is a there is a geometric complexity on knots. City on knots, uh, and that is given like you have the minimum crossing number. This is the minimum number of tetrahedra. Uh, I should say hyperbolic knots, and so you can enumerate knots like that like make a knot table with this complexity. And uh, uh, we, uh, several people have done that. And this was started by Callahan, Dean, and Weeks. Uh, these are called the simplest hyperbolic knots. And this is the hyperbolic knot census. This number here, two, three, tells you uh, what is the, uh, 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 how many tetrahedra there are. So for example, there are two knots uh, which can be uh, triangulated with three tetrahedra and no less. So one is the, so there is only one knot which can be ideally triangulated by two tetrahedra, that is the figure eight. And so Callahan, Dean and we started this enumeration and, uh, and myself with a bunch of co collaborators, we extended this to seven and eight tetrahedra. Uh, you can see these are some of the knots with seven tetrahedra. These are some of the knots uh, with less than or equal to six tetrahedra. These pictures were made by Rob Sharon. Um, these look very, very complicated. So their, their diagrammatic co uh, complexity is very, very high. And so the way I look at it is, if you take the space of all knots and you put on your diagrammatic goggles, uh, which, which shows you uh, knots with low diagrammatic complexity, you get one view of the knot space. But then you change your goggles and you and you put on your your uh, uh, geometric goggles and look at knot space, which are which are geometrically simple. Then you look at you see a completely different view. You see this very 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 complicated knots which are coming up, and but yet they are diagrammatically complicated yet geometrically simple. And so and similarly there are the other way around. You look at uh, uh, look at knots which are diagrammatically simple, but they are geometrically complicated in terms of this uh, kind of uh, complexity. So, um, all right, so now let's go to some examples. Uh, there is, a, um, so how do you actually compute examples here? Uh, so the first thing you want to do is you want to uh, find an ideal triangulation. So finding an ideal triangulation Next one, four. Checkered board uh, polyhedra. And examples. So what is the idea with checkerboard polyhedra? This work was done by Manasco and Aitchinson, Loomsden and Rubinstein. Um, so, um, so if you have a knot, let's just keep look at for alternating knots for, uh, for now. They're much simpler from this point of view. Uh, you have a knot which is a reduced prime alternating diagram, which has one. And then you have the associated checkerboard surfaces. 
checkerboard surfaces just means that uh, you have a knot diagram and you 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 color the faces of the knot diagram in a checkerboard pattern pattern so blue and red surfaces so something like this what you can now do is you can cut uh, uh, the knot complement uh, where the surfaces lie along both of these uh, uh, blue and red surfaces both these checkerboard surfaces simultaneously so you you basically cut it along the blue surface and then you cut it along the red surface and when you do this you basically get a uh, 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 two polyhedra and the knot complement decomposes it decomposes along two polyhedra um, and and these are called the checkerboard polyhedra and now once you can do this you take the checkerboard polyhedra and now you subdivide them into tetrahedra and there is your ideal triangulation uh, this is very similar to you take a torus you take a meridian and a longitude and you cut across the meridian and the longitude and you get a square you basically get a polygon uh, using which you can identify uh, uh, you can identify them <clears throat> and and um, uh, obtain your torus back so uh, the, yeah uh, so there is a procedure to do this i'm just going to quickly explain this uh, procedure uh, what one has to do is one has to put in an edge at every crossing and then you can split up the edge and when you split up the edge you get two polyhedra there is a top polyhedra and there is a a uh, polyhedra on the bottom so uh, this is the schematic for the decomposition so there is a top polyhedra and there is a, a bottom polyhedra and this edge you have a picture which is non planar of the diagram but the with the crossings and you put in an edge in the crossing at every crossing and now you make it a planar picture by splitting the edge so for the top polyhedra this is the scheme in which you split for the bottom polyhedra this is the scheme in which you split and you do this two polyhedra now notice that if you just glue them together as they are you will get back s3 that is not the point the way you glue it is there is a certain way of gluing this you glue this using some kind of a, a, a rotation on on each face so what you do is you glue each face by a rotation uh, 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 depending on the number of uh, edges in the face so if there are four edges you uh, ro you rotate it by uh, uh, say a uh, 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 pi by or a uh, 2 pi by 4 rotation and moreover adjacent faces get get turned in the other direction so uh, this face will get turned in this direction this face will get turned in this direction so it is not a gluing where you are just gluing face to face like this but you actually switch like this and glue and then every face has a way of glu of gluing with the switching and you can kind of think look at this here if you want to get this face to attach here with the edge coming here you need to switch it one and then attach and the same thing over here this has to be then this face has to be switched in the opposite direction so this is how um, you you can actually um, get an ideal uh, get an ideal polyhedral decomposition and so once you have a polyhedral decomposition you can now subdivide it into to get a uh, to get a uh, ideal triangulation decomposition and then you set up your equations and so on so let us just do an example uh, there is, this is the canonical example of figure 8 not i will give you one more example of so here here is a figure 8 knot it is a prime diagram a prime alternating diagram you put in an edge at every place now there are these edges are colored blue and red for for a reason which will be which will become clear in a minute and now uh, we we do this scheme of pushing it to down right so what we are doing here now is that uh, this is the top polyhedron a uh, p plus top polyhedron and this is p minus this is at the bottom and what happens is you are pushing this uh, from the top and 
this is how the edge is getting split. And what's a feature for alternating diagrams is that this graph which you get is basically uh, the same graph as the projection graph of the diagram. This is a feature of alternating diagrams. So that is very nice for alternating diagrams. However, if you want to put some geometry on it, you cannot have bygones. So uh, uh, for geometry, you need, you need to uh, collapse the bygones. For geometry, uh, you need to collapse the bygones. We collapse bygones. And when you collapse bygones, uh, all of the edges gets identified. So in Manasco's paper where this is described, he calls it let bygones be bygones. So you collapse the bygones and, and so then these one and two edges get identified and three and four get identified and hence that explains why two of them are blue and two of them are red. So you effectively get only two edge classes. So these are the two edge classes which you get. <clears throat> and now <clears throat> you can write down the gluing equations uh, for this. So how do you write down this gluing equations? Let me well, put this picture right back here again. And I'll just show you this is actually in this case, it's very simple. Uh, it's simple because uh, you can you can say this is uh, this is z. Let me use another color. Not doing this. So let's let's say this is z. So this is z prime. This is z double prime. And the opposite edges are the same. And this is w. And this is w prime. And this is w is double prime. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So what is the question? Tejas has a question. So, when subdividing the polyhedra into tetrahedra, yeah. how do the how do the diagonals introduced on the faces match up? Uh, well, you have a uh, you yes. So one has to be careful. There is no there is no uh, obvious way to do it. But you you have to divide it in so that the diagonals on the faces have to match up. Yes, that's a good question. Yeah. I am not. I am not giving you that scheme. I'm saying that you have a poly polyhedron, you divide it in, into into tetrahedra. And there are papers which have described describe how to do this. Yeah. So there is uh, one question. Uh, yes. One more question. So is there any connection of uh, this talk to toric ideal? So I, I do not know what is a toric ideal. Yeah. It's, but maybe maybe we can go to back to that question later. Yeah, later. The talk, yeah. So uh, so you see the blue edges are all identified. So the so the gluing equation for the blue edge you will get, uh, or you can just write down the equation from here. There is a z z prime and z prime again, right? These are the opposite edges have the same uh, parameter. So you have your z z prime z prime. I multiplied. And what is here, there are the blue edges, uh, W double prime, W double prime and W prime. So you have multiplied by W prime, uh, W double prime, W double prime equal to one. That's your, that's your edge equation for the blue edge. And now you can similarly write down the edge equation for the, for the uh, red edge also. And with some more effort, Actually, uh, this is exactly the picture from this picture is taken from Jessica's book, Jessica Purse's book. And uh, she, she computes this very explicitly for the figure eight knot. And you can write down what the cusp equation is. So this is what gives you the cusp equation right over here. This is for the meridian cusp. You actually require, um, you actually require uh, only one of the meridian or the, or the longitude equations and um, one of them for each cusp and you require n minus one equations out of the n equations which you get. So now you have two equations and two variables. So we should be able to get a discrete solution. Well, here is the solution. We can just compute it. Uh, this is actually implies that W is equal to Z. All right. So um, we have uh, The W is equal to Z. And if you, if you look at what this equation gives you, 
uh, this equation uh, actually gives you, um, uh, if you, if you do your uh, simplification, it will give you Z prime is equal to Z. And that means that one upon one minus Z is equal to Z. And now you just do your some algebra and you get uh, one plus I square root three by two. But that means that this has the parameter uh, pi I by three. And this means the both of these tetrahedra are a regular ideal uh, tetrahedra. And so uh, that gives you the volume of the figure eight naught uh, is actually two times V tet, right? So that's a, that's a computation for that. Okay. Uh, we still have a little bit of time. Now, you don't have to do this by hand everywhere. There's a very nice program. Um, Uh, called Snappy, uh, which will which will uh, do this for you, and uh, you can I think it's there on the resource website. But you can just do Snappy is a very common name, and you are not able to uh, get get many things with uh, if you just uh, if you Google Snappy, you will get a lot of things which are non math oriented. So uh, uh, there is a screenshot. Uh, let me just. Uh, here is what Snappy looks like. Here is a screenshot of Snappy. Uh, and what you can do is Snappy has a lot, many, many sensors, uh, knot tables, sensors in their hyperbolic manifolds, knots, links, and you can load up the sensors. You can draw the knot on your own. It gives you a bunch of topological information, homology, fundamental group, it gives you a bunch of geometric information. It shows you a lot of information about the cusp. It can also show you some fundamental domains and so on. So there is a lot of information which Snappy can give you. So um, this is what um, uh, I had promised. Now, the, the, now for the surprise additional section, uh, this is going to be a hyperbolic geometry of of virtual knots and links right so what are we going to use the basic idea which we are going to use is that if you take a virtual link then this link uh, corresponds uh, to a link in a thickened surface so link in uh, some S cross I, right? This is a thickened surface. And so what one can do here is an example. Uh, here is the uh, a virtual link. I do not know what the, the name of the link is <laughs> in, um, in the virtual not senses or link senses. I'm not that familiar with it. Uh, but you can see this as actually a link in the thickened surface. In this case, the surface is actually a torus. And so you can, you can look at this as a link in the thickened torus. So this is a thickened torus. You are identifying these things here. So this is, a, this is T2 cross I. So this is your link in T2 cross I, right? So this is a virtual link. And this can be seen as a link in the thickened torus. Now the thickened torus is actually an interesting thing. A thickened torus um, is um, a is S three minus the half link. So you can actually draw this out as a link in S three. So this link in this is actually. So what I'm trying to say is that uh, this T two cross I minus L is in fact S3 minus L union the Hopf link. And so now you can draw this out and you can compute the volume and so on of this. So uh, the volume of this guy, this is a link in S3. 
you can uh, just put, input it into Snappy and fi find this out. And this actually happens to be a four arc. V arc is the volume of the uh, regular ideal uh, octahedron or the volume of the Borromean ring complement. Uh, sorry, whitehead link complement. So volume of a regular octahedron. And so uh, you can actually actually do this uh, um, uh, for virtual links. Now, the, there is one thing which is going on here. Notice that when you have a link in the thickened torus, the torus has boundaries torus, so you can actually make it hyperbolic. The link complement in there will also have boundary torus. But what happens if you get some other thickened surface? So this is a this was done very recently. It's a, uh, it's been uh, uh, very interesting papers uh, by Colin Adams and simultaneously by uh, uh, well, it's not just Colin Adams. Uh, this was done by uh, Colin Adams and his REU group. So this is uh, Colin Adams uh, plus REU students, research experience for undergraduate. So these are, this is what he calls small. That's what it means. That's their group. And it was independently also done, not the same theorem, but a similar theorem uh, by, uh, by Jessica Purcell and Josh Harvey. So they looked at uh, uh, links in the th in thickened surfaces and the hyperbolic geometry of it. So what it says is that the complement of a prime fully alternating link in S cross I is hyperbolic. And it, it, there are some more definitions. But I'm, I've gone over time. So let me, let me stop my talk here. And thank you very much uh, for, uh, for listening. And uh, uh, I think it's uh, already evening there and you must be late for dinner. So I'm, I apologize for holding you back from your food. So thank you very much. Thank you, Abhijit. So any questions? So let me read out one question uh, that uh, I couldn't ask earlier. Yeah, yeah so Abhijit has asked this question. Uh, is it easy to figure out uh, from the knot diagram if the knot is prime for quasi alternating links? Oh, that's a very good question. I have no idea. I have no idea. The quasi alternating definition uh, is uh, is diagrammatic, but is also inductive. And so it is very difficult to say anything because it has to build up on its resolutions and so on. And so um, uh, you may you may be able to uh, deduce uh, whether it's prime or not from the quasi alternating diagram. That is a good question. Uh, but but let me just uh, note that the the theorem that the prime alternating links can be um, seen from the diagram. Uh, uh, that theorem uses a extensive study of the surfaces, essential surfaces in the complement of the <coughs> of the alternating link. And this is Menasco Tisselsway's uh, uh, very fa very famous papers. And so. Uh, uh, they study the topology of the complement and essential surfaces in that. I do not know uh, if the quasi alternating diagram uh, uh, lets you do that kind of stuff. But that is a very good question to understand the topology of the quasi alternating link complement. I have no idea. Quasi alternating links are, are popular because they have very good homological properties in terms of Kavana homology, Higart floor homology. Their, their branch double covers have very nice uh, uh, description, L-space descriptions. And all of that theory and all of the definitions, uh, it doesn't give you some any idea of what the topology of the complement or the geometry of the complement can be. So I, I do not know the answer to that question. And I would like to know the, the answer. That's a very good question. Thank you. Yeah, so one more question from Tejas. So is the hyperbolic volume associated to virtual knots a virtual knot invariant? <laughs> I think all of you are experts on virtual knots much more than I am. I did not attend loose talks on virtual knot theory. And you all did. 
so you all should know the the association for virtual lots and and the links in thickened surfaces and whatever yes. you invariant you have for link in thickened surfaces can you pull it down to virtual lots i think there is a issue with with minimal genus embedding minimal genus yeah right. and so the so if you are able to uh, have a virtual lot there does exist the minimal genus embedding and on that embedding uh, if it is alternating uh, uh that embedding actually has some very good properties this is a recent paper by karimi boden and karimi and um so uh i don't want to say yes or no so i i uh, i i would say if you take a virtual knot you can you can you can canonically associated to a minimal genus embedding then the the volume will be of virtual knot but let me let me take that question to say something more about about this thing if you do not mind uh there is in this whole thing there is something which i am not writing uh there are two cases here there is a genus 1 case and in genus 1 you actually are are able to associate uh links in s3 because of this half link by this half link addition yeah and then then you can get your normal hyperbolic three manifolds uh, everything works out if your genus of the surface is greater than equal to 2 then the boundary of the surface is not even a torus so you cannot talk about finite volume structures and so in that case you have to talk about what are called totally geodesic boundary structures and they are unique and they have a volume and so on so these are totally geodesic uh, structures on your s cross i minus l so this is uh, the surface right so so this is your surface s and these are totally geodesic structures and so um, if you see some of the theorems in this in this uh, uh, in papers they talk about this tg hyperbolic so uh, so just note that there is a slight difference between the genus 1 and the genus greater than equal to 2 case um, uh, that uh, but you still have a, a well defined volume because the totally geodesic structure is unique and you can double it to get a closed manifold and you can associate it to get to to a volume and so on Uh, not a closed manifold here if you double it you will get a a a a a closed manifold minus two copies of this embedding of the link in there which are somehow entangled together so that that a lot of work has to be done a lot, a lot of there are many many open questions and this is really very nice as i said uh, uh, this is the papers by colin adams uh, persil hawi and i should also mention there are papers by myself uh uh kaufman and um, and persil and here we actually did the genus 1 case a lot of work on the genus 1 case so links in links in thick and torus we call them biperiodic links so we did a lot of genus 1 case and then that was generalized by colin and jessica and so on uh to 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 do this more thing so uh, really lot of nice geometry of uh virtual links thank you for that question it gave me a chance to talk about this stuff yes should i stop sharing the screen hello yeah that's okay as you wish so uh, uh, rama mishra has a question so is yes. there a volume conjecture for hyperbolic virtual knots waiting to be made <laughs> Yes, right. <laughs> it is waiting to be made. Yes. <laughs> All right. And there is a question from student. Yes. So how can one calculate zones polynomial after drawing it in Snappy? Is it uh, uh, Snappy does not compute zones polynomials as of now? I do not. I haven't been following what the latest version has. a uh, but uh, it can compute alexander polynomials and it can compute various topological information 
but I do not know what the latest update if they can do it or not. But but at least for 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 a few of the, uh, what it was originally and the way most of the time it has been, uh, you cannot compute Jones polynomial from Snappy. Yeah, you will have to use some other programs. There are many many programs to do this. There is the Mathematica package not theory by drawer. Barnard and uh, there are many other not theory programs which will compute uh, Jones polynomials. Any more questions? So I have one question. So uh, yes. for hyperbolic man three manifolds or higher dimensional manifolds. So geometric invariants are topological invariants. So yes. uh, for hyperbolic uh, knots and links, so this volume and complexity. So uh, is there a purely topological description of these invariants in terms of other invariants which you obtain topologically, which one can obtain? <laughs> uh, yes and no. Okay, so why? Why no? Uh, that's because uh, there is some geometry which is involved, and one would expect to, in order to compute it, one has to do something with respect to geometry. So, uh, but there is also a yes. And as you said, the, because of the, the geometric invariance being topological, what is the topological description of geometric invariance? And that's a very good uh, way of thinking about it. And there is an explanation for volume. And that goes through block invariant. And there is the whole block group. Um, and there are the regulators. Uh, uh, so for example, uh, there is the regulator, the, 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 Ch the Cheeger Chern Simons regulator, which is a map from the third homology of PSL to C to real numbers. And if you take a class there, it's a topological class. Uh, which is uh, which is representing uh, uh, the the uh, a closed hyperbolic three manifold, for example, right? The closed hyperbolic three manifold um, has a uh, top homology, the third homology, which is non-trivial. It is Z, and so it, there is a there is a fundamental class for that. And this fundamental class actually occurs in the third uh, uh, the the third homology group of PSL to C, uh, seen as seen as a discrete. Uh, group, discrete Lie group. And so this class occurs there and this regulator map takes this class to the volume. So there is a description of the volume in terms of this and Walter Neumann has written many papers on it. Uh, there it's called block invariance of hyperbolic three manifolds and in that, that view. And so uh, he, he explained this connection that the volume and the churn simons invariant is obtained as the uh, as the value of the Cheeger Chern Simons regulator on this thing. So um, uh, that is what I know of. That's what I can tell you. Uh, but you did not ask about com I, I, computation. No promises for computation with this topological thing. Some relation. But uh, there is a connection, and you can look at the papers of Walter Neumann on, on block invariance. Thank you. So that, that's a very good question. So I can't see any more questions. So uh, let us uh, give a big round of applause uh, to Abhijit for wonderful talks as usual.